question. Euh, c'est un plaisir pour moi de parler avec vous cet après-midi, euh, mais c'est très important que vous compreniez le mort de Jean d'Arc, ce n'est pas ma faute. Je suis gallois, pas anglais. Euh, Thierry a dit à moi, c'est interdit de parler en français. Donc, I, I'll, I'll say the rest in, in uh, English, I'm afraid. I can speak in Welsh as well, if you like, but no one in the audience will understand, unless there are any Bretons here. So, um, I was going to really talk from the UK perspective, and that actually a lot of the research in the UK has been carried out in Manchester, starting with Jill Birch, who did a lot of epidemiological work, and uh, then some of the really early molecular work was also done in Manchester, although uh, Ros Eels then uh, sort of took uh, a lot of that on. So we built up quite a big cohort in Manchester, and uh, in fact, we now have 70 families uh, that we've identified with germline TP53 pathogenic variants, and 45 of those are missense mutations, so the more classical core binding domain mutations that cause the high penetrance that Thierry has uh, described. In those 70 families, there are 201 mutation carriers and there is a, a bias towards uh, more women than men, maybe because of uh, the breast cancer ascertainment. And 48 we have that are currently unaffected. So I was going to talk a little bit about breast cancer because, as Thierry has said, that is one of my areas. And uh, we have now looked at 305 women with breast cancer under the age of, well, 30 years of age and under. And we carried out a population-based study trying to get all of those cancers over a 15-year period. And in that group, there are 17% with BRCA1 mutations, 9.5% with BRCA2 mutations, and around 6%. We haven't yet finished sequencing all of the uh, women for, for P53. In fact, I, I thought I'd updated this. We have now found a 15th mutation in P53, but it's still at around the 6% level. And uh, the tumors, typically there are two. We have a number with high-grade comedo DCIS, which I think is, is a precursor lesion, and it gives a great opportunity to detect breast cancer early with MRI uh, at, at a stage where it's totally curable. And then uh, the typical adult lesion is a HER2 positive high-grade tumor, although they can be ER negative or ER positive. And in fact, the last one I've just seen yesterday was triple negative. So it, it, they aren't all the same. And in terms of the, uh, uh, the P53, of those with sporadic breast cancer, P53 was pretty much as common as BRCA1 and BRCA2. So without familial breast and ovarian cancer. So uh, this is the updated slide. I've obviously got both of them in there. So this is a, a study by, uh, that was done by Diana Eccles that we contributed to, which was one of the first papers to show this high rate of HER2 expression in, uh, in lee Fraumini syndrome in, in breast cancers with P53 mutations. And more recently, we are starting to see untypical mutations in P53 that give an almost only breast cancer phenotype. And these four families actually, uh, until recently, only had breast cancer, three or four breast cancers at very young ages. In fact, the last one I saw was yesterday with this uh, uh, mutation here. And you can see these are splicing or nonsense mutations. So they're not dominant negative mutations. They're probably giving no useful P53 product. And the question is, is that reliably a different phenotype? Well, unfortunately, one of the, fam one of the women I'll talk about actually had, had this mutation here and is one of our failures of our whole body MRI because she had a liposarcoma in the, in the mediastinum that wasn't detected. It should have been detected, but wasn't detected. 
So when we look at uh, uh, the overall contralateral incidence in the whole group of the population-based study, it's as you might expect at around, uh, uh, at around uh, 0.5, 0.6 percent per year, which is pretty much the rate in, in all populations. But in P53, you see a much higher rate even than in BRCA1 and BRCA2. So here's the P53 here. Interestingly, the only individuals we know about with bilateral breast cancer under the age of 30 are with P53. Uh, the BRCA1s, we've not yet had, BRCA1s and 2 not yet had anyone who's developed bilateral breast cancer under the age of 30. So obviously, uh, you've done a lot of work here in France, and, uh, and you came up with a slightly higher figure in roughly the same number who, who, had, breast, uh, who had P53 mutations at 14%. Uh, and in fact, the Dutch presented this year and found a lower percentage than we did. So I don't know what's going on here, but I, I think that certainly being diagnosed age 30 and under should be part of the Champre criteria, which it is, and is certainly a reason to do, to do testing. So when we look at the, uh, this is a, an assessment of the cumulative risk of breast cancer, and I think Cherry has already told you about the dangers that we have in using the data that we have, because it's relatively, uh, relatively small in terms of numbers, but this is what we get uh, with an agnostic look at uh, the incidence of breast cancer. So, so by 30 years of age, about 20% of women with breast cancer. And then it gets up to about 70% by 50 years of age. And we have very, very little data after 50 years of age. Now, with some mutations outside the typical high penetrance mutations, it is not going to be anything like this. But certainly for the families that we see, prospectively, we see a high incidence rate of breast cancer. So it's not all biased retrospective stuff. So what about the population estimate? Well, I think we were the first to put a figure on this uh, in our Lancet 2003 article, where we estimated that one in 5,000 women, based on the incidence in that population and the, the penetrance uh, by the age of 30 would have a germline p53 mutation again there, there are huge confidence intervals on that when you look at uh, the uh, examination of for instance nomad you do see uh, as many as one in 200 with potentially uh, pathogenic likely pathogenic or, or possibly pathogenic mutations but I think that that is going to be far too high. I, I think that we're probably going to be nearer one in three to 5,000 when we really take the truly high penetrance or, or, or mutations that significantly increase the risk of, of cancer. Uh, and I think we have to be very careful about not conflating uh, mutations in P53, which may as, as Pierre will have told you, cause a different phenotype altogether, almost a non-cancer phenotype. So I think we really have to be careful, particularly in the age of panel sequencing, not to put the two together and say these are all P53 mutations because, as was said earlier, they're not equal, they are different. So um, in terms of Screening in the UK, really, there was no screening until recently. Uh, the first guideline that mentions P53 screening was uh, the NICE guideline, which was only relevant to breast cancer and recommended uh, annual MRI screening from the age of 20. Uh, and the current uh, guideline, uh, the current reiteration of that guideline, uh, uh, again, agreed with that. Uh, there's a general consensus that we should be avoiding, and has been for some time, avoiding any sort of X irradiation form of screening like CT scans. Uh, and then concern that really was MRI going to make a difference if you pick things up early? And obviously, uh, 
uh, the Toronto experience has started to gradually seep through into the UK to the extent that people are being more convinced now. So these are, were the two cancers that were identified in the Marib study. This is the UK MRI screening study that was published about 10 years ago. And in fact, both of those cancers were under the starting age for uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 screening, which was 35. They were both comedo DCIS. So those two women were effectively cured by having their breast cancers picked up on, whole, on a dedicated breast MRI. So, have I gone the wrong way here? Yeah. So obviously, as I've said, uh, the, the Toronto experience has been uh, the galvanizer, and I think probably with, uh, again, David's uh, influence, the meeting uh, of, that the AACR organized to create a consensus for guidelines, uh, uh, there really had to be a response in the UK to that. And, and we tried very hard to get David, but his schedule didn't quite fit with... Uh, uh, they should have asked David, what date can you do? And then we all fitted around him, but it didn't quite work out like that. So um, before I, I go on and say what the UK have decided to do, I'll give you just a little bit of background as to the UK MRI study that was carried out. You've already heard a little bit about that. Uh, uh, but essentially, there was a joint study between ourselves in Manchester and Ros Eels at the Royal Marsden called Signify. And the difference in, in this study is that, uh, that we used... Uh, normal population controls uh, to look at what the pickup rate was in people without p53 mutations. So the aim was obviously to assess how effective uh, whole body MRI was in detecting tumors. This was just a prevalent study, although we've gone on carrying on doing annual screening. And the idea was to screen 44 P53 carriers and 44 population controls. And this is the, uh, basically the algorithm here. Uh, it was read by two radiologists with experience in reading whole body MRI. And obviously we were looking at the, uh, how many cancers were detected, how many were essentially in the end false negatives, uh, and also how many biopsies and how many further uh, uh, radiological procedures were necessary. So you've seen all, some of this data already. Essentially, there were six cancers in the series, two of which, sorry, uh, this is, these are the previous cancers in these women, uh, in these individuals. Uh, the average age, you can see these were perfectly matched here. Uh, and 18 out of those 44 had previous cancers, and you can see breast was the commonest of those. So these were the tumors that were detected. Uh, there were four detected on the protocol uh, and two that were subsequent diagnoses. As I've already mentioned, one of them should probably have been picked up. The other was a leukemia, which obviously whole body MRI is not able to detect. So in more detail, you can see here an astrocytoma, a myxosarcoma, a chromophobe renal sarcoma, a Lyomar sarcoma, so two in that individual, and then uh, these uh, kidney and liver tumors and a, an osteosarcoma. So a number of tumors, but as far as individuals are concerned, four. All of these were detected with curable, uh, uh, with curable intent and were completely resected. So uh, these are, are some of the images picked up. This is obviously the, the whole body and then uh, uh, picking it up uh, on different imaging. Again, that's the glioma. These are the kidney angiomyelarpomas, which are not malignant tumors as such, but can be. Uh, th this is an osteosarcoma. Uh, this is the mediastinal sarcoma that unfortunately uh, was initially dismissed as a pericardial cyst. Uh, and it's part of the learning curve that actually this wasn't a pericardial cyst, it was actually a sarcoma. Uh, 
uh, and perhaps uh, further imaging at that time with gadolinium would have given us the right answer. Uh, this is an abdominal mixosarcoma uh, picked up at two and a half centimeters. And there were, then there were a number of non-malignant findings. And you've, you've heard all about this, so I'm not going to go into great detail. But there appeared to be, as David said, more of these benign, funny things in, in Lee Fraumini in the P53 carriers than in the controls. So the question is, are some of those precursors for malignancy, and in fact, by detecting and removing them, you are actually making a difference. So overall, the detection rate, uh, if you take the, the, the year follow-on time, was 13.5%. Uh, the detection rate on MRI was 9% as a baseline study. And there were no cancers in controls. So those are the study sites. Obviously, all of the MRI was carried out in Manchester and, and London. So you've already heard again as well about the, uh, the uh, meta-analysis that was published in JAMA Oncology. Uh, they came up with a, a baseline rate of 7%. And all of this is telling us something. These very high prevalence uh, numbers tell us that screening is likely to be effective. What you see when you see a low prevalence figure, and the prevalence figure equals the incidence figure, essentially that screening is not working. But you see a very big prevalence effect, and in fact we have now carried out 60 annual MRIs and not found another tumor. So you're, you're, you're sucking up all the cancers in the system, so some of these may not be so rapidly growing because we're picking them up at an earlier, less malignant stage. Uh, I think a, a grade drift is something that people, a lot of people are, are, are slightly cynical about, uh, especially in breast cancer. Things don't go from grade two to grade three, but we have seen an astrocytoma go from grade two to grade three uh, as part of our follow-up uh, of, of a tumor that we have picked up in the past. So, obviously, um, uh, this was the main stimulus uh, to us feeling we had to address this issue in the UK, and I worked very strongly with Helen Hansen in London to make sure that we had a guideline group come together, which included patients, as, as you have many patients here today, I believe. And um, so we met on July the 6th, with experts in oncology, genetics, radiology. We did intend to have David, but I know, I know. Excuses. <laughs> so um, in the end, we came to a consensus that was very close to the Toronto Protocol, but not quite uh, reaching it. And I, I'm a bit worried by the amount of colorectal cancers and adenomas you've picked up, David, because that was one of the things that was chucked out. Um, so uh, this is the, uh, the main protocol, abdominal ultrasound, three to four monthly, uh, from birth to 18 years of age, along with the biochemical tests. Breast cancer annual dedicated MRI. Uh, many people, many women ask with P53 mutations, do I really need to have the breast MRI as well as the... Uh, as the whole body, yes, you do, because this is going to pick it up at a very early stage. The whole body has thicker cuts and doesn't have gadolinium in, in many uh, uh, institutions, so you do need the whole body, um, uh, the, the dedicated breast MRI. Uh, annual dedicated brain MRI from, from birth, with a, with a first with contrast, so exactly the same. Um, we didn't feel that hematological surveillance was indicated, so that regular full blood counts were not included. And colonoscopy was only indicated if there was a history of uh, uh, colorectal cancer in the family. We did go along with the dermatological review, although we said from 18, David, so maybe uh, 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 we should look at that again. And then the physical examination, again, in children, but in adults, for adults to come when there's a red flag sign. And eligible individuals, we were quite strict on this, 
that this would be patients with pathogenic TP53 variants, which were class four or five according to ACMG guidelines. So a lot of these variants that are being picked up on panels that some people are calling likely pathogenic, we would not include uh, because of the concerns that actually they probably aren't uh, significant increases of cancer risk. Um, patients with low penetrance pathogenic variants until further data on risk was available specific to that, that variant. Patients with constitutional germline mosaicism for a pathogenic variant verified in at least two tissues. That's to get round the issue of individuals who are, have P53 mosaicism in blood caused by treatment uh, and you get uh, a, a marrow overgrowth of, uh, of a bloodline that has P53, you have to then confirm that it's true mosaicism by looking in another tissue like skin. And then patients affected with cancer fulfilling the classical criteria of LFS. So who isn't eligible? So we felt that, that patients at 50% risk would not be eligible and that that would mean that you would have to test children in order for children to get access to this. We didn't feel it was reasonable that a child should be subjected to this sort of medicalization if they did not have the P53 mutation, and certainly not to have general anesthetics if that was required for whole body MRI. Um, so there were some other recommendations. Coordination of screening in children should be coordinated and managed through specialist pediatric oncology clinics. Coordination of screening in adults should be coordinated and managed through clinical genetics. And we've got a lot of experience of doing that. And whole body MRI should only be undertaking where there is relevant experience. Local clinical genetic centers may wish to consider referral for this to another center or MDT. So that's uh, a summary of where we are in the UK. Uh, this is not yet funded, but we have been promised by someone fairly high up in the health service that it is likely that if we put this in, it will uh, be funded. Um, and again, we have to be careful here. When you want the frequency of something to be higher so that it's recognized and you get more political will behind you, you don't want it to be so high that it then becomes expensive. So there are advantages with having a frequency below one in 2000 because that's still a rare disease. You do not want it to be one in 500 or one in 1000. It is no longer a rare disease and this sort of thing is unlikely to be funded. So just that salient last comment. And uh, I'd like to, to thank a lot of people in Manchester, Helen uh, for her uh, work in putting the meeting together in London and Roz especially for Signify and Jill Birch for inspiring me in 1990 to look at Lee Frau Mini syndrome.